Welcome back to Playful Learning with Loose Parts. And if you've just joined us, welcome. My name is Liz McCaw, and I'll ask you to make sure that your mic is turned off. And I wanted to let you know that as you're listening to this presentation, if you have any questions, just type them in the chat and we'll answer them at the end of the slideshow. So the first framework I'd like to talk about is counting collections. So counting collections is an old routine. It's been around for a long time. And in kindergarten, I begin the year using jars with small quantities. And the children just count what the objects in a jar, take a new jar and count again. And it's just counting, counting, counting. And I start with about a five minute block of time. And then gradually I add a few minutes as their stamina is increasing. And at the same time, as I'm getting to know the children, I'm adding more objects to the jars so that there's a range of numbers. And over time, their stamina will grow from five minutes to 30 minutes. And the number of jars will grow from 10 or 11 to 30 and 35. The quantity in the jar will grow from three to five to five, 10, all the way up to 100. In the spring, I add a second task to the counting collections, and that's when the children finish counting. They get a clipboard and they record their number and they show how they count it. So for example, a child with 20 objects who's counting by twos might draw 10 circles and put two dots in each circle and show a sum of 20. A child who was counting up to 100 might have counted by 10, so they would draw larger circles and put 10 dots. This is a partner activity. So I like to put my children together, um, not by skill, but rather socially, but who works well with who. And then what they do is um, they go and they confer and they talk together and they say, well, will we have one jar or will we have two? Will we count together? Let's count by twos today. And what will the recording look like? And so they have a little chat and then one person goes to get the jars while the other partner chooses a quiet spot in the room. We want them to spread out in the classroom so they're not distracted um, by other students. My job during counting collection is to observe the children, listen to their conversations, and ask any questions um, that to clarify what they're doing if I'm not quite understanding. And then I take that information and I review it and then that helps me plan my next mini lesson. This is an example of grade two children at the beginning of the year. And you can see they start their year with a recording sheet and not too large a quantity of objects. If we're not doing counting collection, then we're doing math partner play. And with the same partner, they'll um, play a math game. So it could be a board game, it could be a counting game, it could be a subitizing game, it could be a sorting or making patterns. So each day, they spend eight to 10 minutes playing a math game. And over time, they go through all of the kindergarten math concepts over and over again. I teach new games during exploration time in the morning to small groups. And then when the children are independent, I add that math game to math centers, and I'll take one that's been in there for a while. And I just keep rotating through the centers each day. Now this is literacy. Play. And so this framework is very similar to the math. One large difference is that the children are partnered with um, other children who have similar skills. And so this is flexible partnering. And so over time, the partners will be changing depending on how what their learning needs are. And so just like math play, the children have eight to 10 minutes to play an activity with their partner. And then when they hear the bell, they just clean it up. And they'll go through all of the literacy concepts, including listen to reading, uh, practice reading, small emergent books with controlled vocabulary. They'll play alphabet games and sound games, letter recognition games, and sight word games. They'll do rhyming games with rhyming baskets and objects. When we're not doing literacy, we're often doing art. I have quite a large uh, area of the classroom dedicated to art. Most of our art is process art. And so process art is focusing not necessarily making a product and not necessarily having directions on how to create that product. So for example, I have a lot of empty 
picture frames. So they'll be out on the table with some baskets of loose parts and they'll go and they'll create their art and if they really love it, they'll take a picture of it and upload it to their ePortfolio. When they're finished, they'll just tidy up the loose parts and they'll go to another center. Sometimes they do make a product though and it's either a collaborative approach or it's an individual approach. So one example is muffin tin painting. I've got that in the upper right hand corner. And what they do is they paint the top of the muffin tin and then they just press cartridge paper squares on top of it and they create all these wonderful swirly patterns. When it's dry, they just glue it together and make a large collage. And they take the leftover ones home and they'll use the back of the painting to make little note cards for family and friends. In the bottom right hand corner, you'll see a child working on a tree branch. We often find loose parts in the forest. We'll bring them back to do some art with. And so the children decided they wanted to paint the branches and make a classroom chandelier. I have an assessment block in my daily schedule. It's 20 to 25 minutes. And when I'm doing assessment at this time, the children are working with one person doing independent activities and they know that I'm not available to help them or to work with them. And during this time, once the children are settled, I'll call a student over and I'll give them a task. So I might be asking them to create a pattern for me or to read some alphabet letters or some sight words or to do some counting for me. And so I've just included some photos from my photo gallery. And so if I'm outdoors with the children and I'm not teaching a lesson, then during, during that longer exploration time, I'll just call them over and ask them to make a pattern or to do number grouping or to do some counting for me. And that's an opportunity for me to work one-on-one -on -one and do a closer observation. Sometimes I'll make a video or I'll take some photos to help me remember when I'm back in the classroom. In the afternoon, I might ask students to um, use some classroom materials. I'll have a little basket of activities and I'll just play a game with them and see how they do with the game. And I might even ask some questions to get a better understanding of their thinking. Story play is a big part of the kindergarten program. And this is when um, children, already, we know we already, they already come to school telling stories. And I want to give them opportunity to share those stories and to build their oral language and co-construct stories with a friend. And so we do this quite a bit in the fall. And then as time goes on and their stamina builds and they're able to work at it and create much more complex stories, then we move to um, once a week for about 30 minutes and they'll come into the classroom and create their stories and then tell their stories. And then sometimes they'll draw their stories and write their stories as the year goes on. So it starts off maybe a 10 minute activity, but at the end of the year, they're up to 35, 40 minutes. And these are just some photos from this year. Sometimes we use story play on the light table. We'll do it with clay or paint or big fat crayons and they'll work together to co-create a story. Now, even though I have story play as a whole group activity, it's so popular and it's so good for developing oral language and relationships that I always offer it during exploration time. So I dedicate a shelf, and this is just an example of what I do. So I'll have four, maybe four or five baskets of story props, and on top of the shelf, I'll have some extra props like trees or some fabric, maybe a basket of shells or flowers, or some extra peg people that they can shop the top of the shelf and add to their story play basket. It's such a successful program that we decided that our primary teachers would apply for a grant and we would create um, a, a cart with shared resources. And so the shared resource cart has some containers with sort of props that complement each other. Like we might have an ocean theme with some mermaids and some pirates, or we might have a forest theme with some bears and some pine cones for trees and something for the grass. And then we also have one shelf that has just loose parts. So just like in my classroom, the students can shop the top of the story play bookshelf. They can also shop the top shelf of the rolling cart and they can get like maybe some extra ceramic leaves or some gems or maybe some wooden caves or a little bird and add it to their story play. And when the teacher is finished with it, 
they put it all back on the rolling cart and it just moves to the teacher who's going to use it next. So perhaps I might use it Monday and Wednesday mornings and another teacher might use it Monday, Wednesday afternoons and another Tuesday, Thursday and another one Friday afternoon. Of course, we all have some story play resources that belong to our classroom. So you need a dedicated cupboard to keep those in. And I like to keep them really organized so that it just takes me a few minutes to set out story play um, when I'm using it for uh, morning tables. So I've got it organized so that I have some containers and I've got some setting props and then I've got some themed boxes. So one might have uh, a fall resources with leaves and some trees and something might be Arctic animals. Another one might be um, forest and another one might be pond. And so just <coughs> pardon me, areas that interest the children. I, we just slowly accumulate the resources. On the bottom shelf, I've got lots of different fabrics and some characters for story play. This is the last section of today's workshop. And I just, because I'm an outdoor teacher, I just wanted to share with you some literacy and some math that happens outdoors with our classroom. So this is just some children doing some sorting one morning. And these are beautiful mandalas that we make when we go to the big forest. This is my little counting kit. So in my backpack, I have a small bag for literacy and a small bag for numeracy so that I can work with children or with small groups. This is a child sorting the materials to get ready to make patterns. This is called the stick game. And so in the fall, they have five to six sticks. And in the spring, they'll have 10 to 15. And they roll the die and they move that many sticks towards themselves. And then it just keeps going back and forth. And at the end of the game, the child with the most sticks is the winner. This is some symmetry we worked on. We had some leftover clay and we decided we would take it to the forest and do some math with it. Um, the picture on the left is just a very common primary game called shake and spill. So they shake the stones in their hand and they spill it over the rock and then they make the number sentence. Two plus three, four plus one, five plus zero. On the right hand side is a Mandela that we made at the beach and this was actually inspired by the book A Beach Walk and the children worked in small groups to create beautiful Mandelas using nature's loose parts. On the left hand side is a game that I play a lot at the beach in the forest and we just call it the composition decomposition game and I give the children a bag full of counters and they just make a row. They count how many are in the row and then I just keep changing the number and they add and take away counters to make the new number. On the right hand side is a game my student teacher uh, developed based on a game from the book Messy Math by Juliet Robertson and the children were looking for objects in the forest that were as wide as their palm. Oftentimes we make little cards shapes out of cereal box and then we make it into a math kit and then the children go on a math hunt looking for that shape and so this child decided that we should have a heart shape and she decided to make it and take a picture so that we could look for hearts in the forest the next time we went. Um, this photograph is from a teacher that I'm on Twitter with and so she gave me permission to share some of her math prompts. So during this learn at home time she asked her students to take a number walk and to share with her what numbers did they see. And this is one of her students' response. And on another day, she said, take a measurement walk. So they took a pencil and they went outside and they looked for nature objects that were taller than the pencil, shorter than the pencil, that the pencil was wider than. And they just compared that and sent the photos into her. And this is her third picture where she asked them when they went for their neighborhood walk if they could look for patterns and take a pattern walk and send her the photos. This is a photo from um, Dee McLennan who has a blog on Reggio inspired math and literacy. And so this was a measurement activity that she posed for her students. Could you use your feet to measure objects outside? And so this child was measuring how many feet long was this stump? One morning we were at the park and they'd been doing some landscaping and so they left a pile of stones for us to play with. And so the students immediately all began making stone cairns. We left them in the forest and then when we went back two days later, instead of having 20, we had 40 and they were all in the nooks of the trees and on the 
um, fence posts and the nursery logs. They were just everywhere and it looked like they'd had babies and the children were so excited to and surprised by what passerbys had done while we were at the beach. Sometimes you might want to do some literacy. So this is an example of some liter simple literacy at the beach where the students had sticks and so some were doing alphabet sounds and some were doing alphabet names and others were doing kindergarten sight words and other students still were printing each other's names. This is a game I like to play at the beach and you can see that each child has similar sheets but they each have their own words and it's a bingo game. So I just call out the word and they put a little tree cookie beside the word and here's an example I called out this word and this child had it on their sheet as well. This is from Fiddleheads Nature School and so they were just asking their students to practice printing and so they had little clipboards and markers and pieces of paper and the children were just doing some writing. Well thank you so much for uh, joining us for this session. And I wanted to remind you that we're going to go through questions before we close today. The um, code for my Google Doc is above, so if you just take a copy of it, you'll be able to access our Google Doc, and I'll just show you what it looks like. Let's see if we can go to it. So this is a read-only, and it's a live doc, so I'll be adding on to it. So you can see that it's got all the information that was in the slideshow and there's some pictures there's lots of links so if it's highlighted you just go to the beautiful stuff program that we talked about earlier and it'll be there as you can see the collection ideas is much larger and creative ways to use it and then I shared some class projects with you so the collage and then this is the alphabet wall that we talked about earlier and this is the hopes and dreams that the parents did as a home project. And you can see that these are the learning frameworks that we talked about. And there's some recommended reading. There's lots of links. And there's some journal article links. And I hope that you find this helped you. And I'm looking forward to hearing how this loose parts become a part of your daily practice. So thanks again.